those who believe because, because our testimony among you was believed. Please be seated. You have a book like this sitting in front of you? Grab it and turn to page 916. We're going to need that in just a moment. 916. I'm sure I've got that somewhere in here. There it is. I'm going to mark your mind, you mark yours, and we'll get to that in just a moment. We have made our way up to the book of 2 Thessalonians. And the key word in 2 Thessalonians is, and seems to be even for the day, judgment. Uh, it's similar in its writing to First and Second Peter. And because I get to choose what verses are what, the key verses I have assigned are verses 7 through 10. The key chapter is chapter 2, that we are called unto salvation via the means of the gospel, and that gospel exclusively. The subject of this book is the judgment of Christ upon the return with an emphasis on the doomed who are the disobedient. A lot of times you don't see that aspect of it. You see the aspect of uh, the benefit for the child of God, but you rarely see one as it's written with uh, the perspective of the disobedient. In this book lies a warning for the wicked, for those who do not obey the gospel, and for those uh, that we don't necessarily think of as being wicked, we call them their good moral folks. You know what Jesus would call them? Lost. He, he, you know, Jesus never calls into question their sincerity. Jesus never calls into question their, uh, their, their desire even. He calls into question whether or not they have been obedient. Uh, Paul was the human penman of this letter, probably written somewhere around 53 A.D. This is the shortest letter written to a congregation in the New Testament. This congregation is still working on a skewed view from 1 Thessalonians of the return of Christ. Now they're getting better, but they hadn't worked their way all the way through it by the time this particular book is written. This uh, book, this letter contains four prayers and one prayer request. It's an interesting note in this uh, book that God should be a capital G. Points out the sin of being a busybody, chapter 3. We can fight and fight to remain faithful and be seen, God as, or seen, as God, seen by God as wicked simply by not keeping our nose out of other people's business. Imagine that. Uh, where are we at here? One great verse to memorize, if you find one, is chapter 3, verse 13. But be ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. While this is the second book to clear up some misconceptions about Jesus' return, God does not allow Paul to berate these brethren. It seems as if they're really struggling with this idea. And just like every other chapter, every other book within the confines of the Bible, you can see the glory of God and the glory of Jesus, not only of every chapter of this Bible, but dripping off of every verse of this particular Bible, of this particular book. Now, back to song number 916. You have that song in front of you? So, thank you, John. Somebody else speak English? Shake your head this way. We're going to sing it. Uh, we're going to sing it a little bit faster than you normally sing it because this is not a sad song from the perspective from which it's written. And I hope this particular song will be a good uh, introduction to this particular lesson. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more.
Keep your books open there to 916. Notice how this song is written. There's coming a day when no heartaches will come, no clouds in the sky, no tears. It's only peace in a glorious place. And he ends that verse by saying, what a day, what a glorious day that will be. He moves into verse 2 and he says this, there's no sorrow, no burdens, no sickness, no pain, no parting over there. And forever, forever I will be with the one. With that one who was outspread on a cross and gave himself for me. He ends that particular verse by saying, what a day. What a glorious day that will be. And each time you go into this chorus, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one, the one who still has the nail-scarred hands and the one who still has the, the side that's riveted, what a day that will be when I see him. When my Jesus I can see, and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. And when he takes me by the hand, and he personally shows me the reward of heaven that has been given to me simply because I knew enough to be obedient to his word. What a day. What a day that will be. And then in verse 3. Verse 3 is found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning in verse number 6. Verse 3, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of his Lord and from the power of his glory. What a terrible day that will be. What, a, what an awe-inspiring day for some. What a terrible day gut-wrenching day for others. What if it's the day you, do, you, uh, you figure out that what you thought you knew about the Bible is not true? What if that's the day that you figure out that what you did know about the Bible you should have been obeying? What if that's the day you figure out you, you have no more time and you can't go back? What if that's the day you really put the pieces together? The tragedy of that is now you take into an eternal punishment the fact that you have all the pieces of the truth together. Or maybe you've had them together for a while. Or maybe you should have been obedient to them. Or maybe I should have been walking closer to them. Or maybe I should have been leading better.
What a day that will be. The perspective of the song is a beautiful perspective from the perspective of that faithful child of God who's going to reap that reward at the end of time. That's going to be a beautiful thing. But what happens if you're in verse 3? And what we generally do, we look at 2 Thessalonians and say, well, it's going to be a great day as God would say in verse number 7, rest with us. It, it will be a great day. If that's your day. Now, here's what I want you to do. As you read and understand those words, I want you to look at three groups of people that are found in verses 8 and 9. The first group are those who are disobedient or never knew the gospel. That's going to be a terrible day for those who did not know what to do or said, this is foolish and I'm not going to do it. Can you imagine how much they would wish they would have simply five more minutes on earth where they could make the corrections where eternity would be so much better for them? If I just had a few more moments. Well, you've got moments now. You've got them now. That first group that we see are those who look at the truth and turn their backs on it or unfortunately have never seen it before. And they make a decision, those who would turn away from truth, as to say, I'm not going to follow that. And that decision will haunt you through eternity. Second group of people there. The second group of people are implied. And the second group of people are those who know what the truth is and have been obedient to it. All of the things that are mentioned in verse 8 and 9 on those negative connotations where, where that angel will be coming in with flaming fire taking vengeance on them is not seen for this group. This group that, that's implied here is different. This day is different for them. Why? Because they chose properly. Now, when you're confronted with the truth, what are you going to do with it? Because the decision of where you spend or you live through eternity, I don't even think you can live through eternity. The, the question of wherever your eternal destination will be is literally in your hands. And that group that's implied makes the right choice. And I'll guarantee you this, just as much as that first group will consider the choice they made throughout eternity, so will the second one. How glad will they be that they knew what the truth was? How happy will they be that they followed those things? Now there's a third group. There's a third group and it's implied also. It's implied from the group of people who know not God. That's the implication right there. Why don't they know, church? Oh, well, they, didn't, they, didn't, they weren't uh, bothered with it to find out. Well, isn't that our job? Shake or nod. So when they don't know, is God going to look at me and say, Hayes, why didn't they know? Is that not my job? Is it not your job? Is it not your job? Is it not your job? Is it not all of our jobs? Those who don't know are probably not going to know because I wouldn't say something to them. And don't think you're going to get into eternity and avoid that question. Don't think that's going to happen. God's going to say, why didn't you do what I told you to do? Well, I didn't think people would like that. Or I didn't know. Son, you are dealing with people's eternity. 
Notice how he says it to the apostle, or, or rather to the prophet uh, Ezekiel, as he speaks to him in Ezekiel chapter number 4. He said, I, son of man, oh, I love that phrase, son of man, I'm going to make you a watchman over Israel. Now, here's what I want you to do. You tell them, and then step back. Now, if you tell them and they change, well, that's going to be good for them. That's going to be good for you. If you tell them and they don't change, that's going to be bad for them, but it's going to be good for you because you did your job. He's going to come back and say, but watchman, son of man, if you don't tell them, the blood of the lost are going to be on your hands. So somebody from the church, please explain to me 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8. If they don't know, who's it fall on? And here's what we hate to say, because really we hate to think about this. It falls on us. That's our job. That's the directive from God to us. How many people in my neighborhood will be lost because they don't know? Not, not over in Africa, somewhere where I've never been, how many people in my neighborhood are going to be lost because they don't know? Even better, how many people that live inside my house will be lost because they either don't know or won't comply and, and I haven't encouraged them to do that? Dad, you think they're going, God's going to ask me about that? Shake your head this way. Because he is. What a day that will be. What a beautiful day that will be for those who have been obedient. What a terrible day that will be for those who have been disobedient. That's 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 6 through 9. We could spend a lot more time and go through the rest of the chapters. But I think it, until we get that right, we really don't need to move on from it. Until we understand what we're doing, why we're doing, and how it affects our eternity, we ought not move on from that. Matter of fact, probably next week we ought to just have the same lesson over again because I'm not sure we're going to be obedient to it now. I want you to look at yourself and look at your life in the perspective of the Holy Word of God, the Bible. Look at your life. And only yours. Don't look down the aisle way. Don't, Michael, don't look at Lisa and say, boy, she got a lot of work to do. Don't do that. Look just at yours and answer this question. Is God satisfied with me? Yes or no? Don't answer out loud. He either is or he's not. And you either know that he is or you know that he's not. Now, there are a couple of remedies. I'd like to tell them to you if you'd like to hear them. If he's not happy with you, you could obey the gospel. Because maybe he's not happy with you because you haven't obeyed the gospel. Maybe he's unhappy with you because you haven't yet decided to follow him. That's an easy process. Hearing is not enough, but it's part of it. Believing is not enough, but it is part of it. Repentance is part of it. Confession, yes, that's there. It culminates in baptism. All of those things lead up to baptism where I bury an old man and ra am raised to walk in the newness of life, the entire chapter of Romans 6. You could be obedient to the gospel tonight if you never have. But as I look around, I see a lot of people who have. 
so. There is another possibility. It could be that you have obeyed that gospel, and for some reason, either the cares of this world or the concerns of other people have pulled you away, and sometimes you veer back, and sometimes you veer away, and veer back, and veer away. You can just come home. You can just come back home to God who loves you and misses you and wants you to be where you're supposed to be anyway. You could come back home to a God that wants you to be successful and not one that he has to say, why didn't you do what I asked you to do? And you can do that tonight. As easy as coming back to God and praying that, uh, that the, the sins that you have in your life will be forgiven. And he's promised he'll do that. Look, he hasn't even said, you know, it might be 80-20 where I will do that or not do that. He has promised he will do it every time. It's a guarantee. Momentarily, we're going to sing an invitation song. And when we sing that song, I hope piercing through your mind is the fact that there are those who don't know and haven't obeyed and that while your day might look wonderful, what does their day look like? For those who have not obeyed, let me give you all the encouragement I have. If you'll come down here and, and confess that Jesus is the Christ, I'll baptize you myself, and I won't, I won't hold you under very long. It's a matter of your eternity that we're dealing with. Why does he always preach about the judgment? Because it's coming, and you'd better be ready. That's the most important day in the, the life of humanity. And we walk through this life as if it's never coming. Guess what? Let me be the first one to tell you if you never heard this. It's coming. And while it is a glorious day for some, it could be an awful day for others. And you have the opportunity now, you have the opportunity right now to change your eternal destiny. Make your choice while we stand and sing.